Okay, everybody's here. So uh, hello everyone and welcome to the repeat performance <laughs> of our North American Expats in France Financial Forum first quarter. We are repeating this uh, event, which we did last week, last Wednesday, uh, because our Zoom account wouldn't let everybody in. So now we have a chance uh, for you to see it again or for newcomers to see it for the first time. And I was told I should introduce myself because I assume everybody uh, um, knows me, but I, that's, I'm sure that is not true. And I am Adrian Leeds of the Adrian Leeds Group. We are property consultants in France. We are a licensed real estate agency. We operate all over France. And we have a particular interest in Paris and in Nice and the Côte d'Azur, but um, we do uh, work with property and our consultant, our uh, clients all over the country. And uh, I am a co-host of tonight's event with Brian Dunhill of Dunhill Financial, and Brian's here with us. He's going to open the program, but before we do, Brian, if you'd hit the slide, here's the agenda for this evening. It's going to be one hour long. Uh, first, of course, is my introduction. Then we're going to start with Brian, and he's going to talk about various aspects of financial planning. Then Brian is going to introduce Benjamin Pick of Pick Consulting, um, and he's going to he'll describe who he is and what his roles are. But he's going to talk about French taxation from Ed A to Z. Brian's going to come back and talk about some other tax issues. I'm going to talk about property taxes, and then at the end we're going to have a full Q and A, which gives you an opportunity to ask the questions that um, you've been dying to ask. I will ask you, however, to please stay on topic and not try to get too personal so that everyone can benefit from the answers. Uh, and this is being recorded. It will be available on YouTube, on Brian's YouTube channel so that you can view it again or you can share it with your friends, whatever you wanna do. And stay muted if you don't mind, keep your microphones off so during the presentation. But once the presentations are over and we open up the Q&A, we'll probably ask you to ask the question yourself live. You can also put your questions in the chat box because Patty Sadoskas, who's here with us helping us out, Patty, you could wave, wave just so that everybody can see you. Patty's going to monitor these questions, and um, we're going to try to answer as many as we can, but it's not a lot of time. So on that note, uh, let me also say that this is quarterly. This is the first quarter. So the second quarter edition is on April 28th for the spring. The summer edition is July 29th, and the fall is October 27th. You can go on to adrianleads.com under events. You'll find us and you can register for each one of those in advance if you like. And every um, quarter we will have a different topic and a different speaker. So uh, that should, you know, keep you pretty well informed. That's our goal. So how about we start with Brian. You're up, Brian Dunhill. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Adrian. Only one thing to correct in there, Adrian. I, I thought we were just doing it again because uh, we had so much fun last week that we wanted to do it again. Um, well, that's for sure. We always have fun, Brian. Exactly. I mean, that's, you know, if, if you're not having fun, there's no point, right? <laughs> um, so thanks for everybody joining. Uh, my name is Brian Dunhill. Uh, my firm is an American expat firm, and um, we specialize on situations where Americans are, are abroad. Uh, so I want to start by just rehashing some of the reminders. If, if you want a full encompass look at, at, at how we look at financial planning, we have plenty of view, uh, videos on our YouTube channel under Dunhill Financial. But for here, we're concentrating on taxes today. Um, so from a tax perspective, without taking away from, from Benjamin's thunder, uh, essentially a few things to remember with your investments because the double taxation treaty between America and the United States is one of the best in the world. Make sure you keep your investments in the United States that will keep you in the, the lower tax bracket and it will avoid any of these PFIC, passive foreign investment companies. Um, if you never have to learn what a PFIC is, you'll be a very happy person. And that even is considered using the QEF election. Um, you're getting a lot of financial advisors pitching that. Take a look on Google, put in PFIC, put in QEF election. You're never gonna found, find a US tax accountant that advocates that that's better than just buying your securities in the United States. So very easy way, set up, 
buy your securities in the United States, but you also want to take into consideration currencies. Uh, currencies are a funny thing. We went 10 years uh, where essentially the U.S. dollar was going up. Um, after two crises, including this pandemic, people were going to a flight to safety and that meant moving towards U.S. dollars. But as of last August, we're in a new position where all of a sudden the dollar has started going down, not necessarily just to the euro, but the global basket of currencies. So it's important that if you're retiring in Europe, that we think in euros and we invest in euros. So we wanna invest in the United States, but we wanna make our portfolio more Eurocentric to minimize some of those risks. That's gonna be the easiest way to get good long-term returns in our portfolio. Now, some things that you wanna think about when you're hiring a financial advisor, make sure you have somebody that's not only US regulated so that they can help on these US aspects of things, but that's also European regulated. Um, this will help make sure that they understand those cross-border issues. And I always find it important that you only work with a fiduciary. A fiduciary is somebody that doesn't work on a commission basis, but instead is always having to work with your best interest in mind. Um, again, on our YouTube channel and on our website, you can learn more about fiduciaries. Or if you want the satirical approach, look up John Oliver's retirement planning. Um, John Oliver from HBO did a great 20 minute piece on it and you'll get a good laugh while learning all about it. The last pitch that I'm gonna actually put in here um, as a part of the advisory board for American Citizens Abroad, uh, which has a ton of great resources for all of us American expats, uh, ACA, AARO, uh, and uh, a lot of other organizations, which includes my company um, and several others, we're gonna be recruiting a, or voluntolding Adrian and, and Benjamin to be joining this coalition. Uh, as of last week, we've started the Residency-Based Taxation Coalition. Um, the website is right there on your page. Uh, and um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to work together towards uh, shifting Congress and the Senate towards wow. thinking about residency-based taxation. And as you guys know, this is something that uh, will affect all of you and we want uh, you to be involved and know about it. So check out the website if you please and um, we'll continue updating uh, on those types of aspects. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing my friend, uh, Benjamin Pick. Um, Benjamin Pick is a French and American CPA and he holds his degrees from the University of Paris Dauphin and uh, Concordia University over in Canada. He spent years and years on the US desk uh, in Paris uh, with several international accounting firms and um, working on North America, Middle East and Europe and coordinated French and foreign report audits, provided advisory services and governance and risk reporting. He's a wealth of knowledge. We're really happy that he's joined us today. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Benjamin to take you through how taxes work in France. Thank you, for Brian, for uh, this introduction. Uh, I'll try to speak uh, slowly this week. Uh, so the first question to ask uh, ourselves, it's the question of residency. Uh, maybe if you can move the slide, thank you. The first question to ask yourself, it's who is liable to French income tax? If you live in the US, are you liable to French income tax? If you live in France, are you liable to French income tax? This is a real question, and this is the first question you need to ask yourself when you're planning to have some investment or buying some properties or living in France. So there is two, possible, two options. The first one is you're liable of French tax income if you're a French tax resident. I'm going to, I'm going to explain what is a French tax resident in the next slide. Um, but if you're a French tax resident, you will that will be, you will be liable to your worldwide income and you and you and all your family, not only you, but all your family. There is a second option where you can be liable to French tax. If you are not fiscally resident, it's you have income in France. So I have a couple of clients who are coming from, uh, from the US, they have investments in France, and there is a question, they should pay tax in France or in the US, only in France or only in the US, in both countries. This is an important question that needs to be addressed uh, when you have some investments in France. Fortunately for us and fortunately for uh, to everyone, there is a tax treaty between France and the US and to just to avoid a situation where you need to pay double taxation. Uh, you won't be, uh, I'm going to be clear on that, you won't pay double tax on the same source of income. There is a tax treaty for every type of income you have, 
or you're going to you're gonna be taxed in the US or you're going to be, you're gonna be taxed in France, but technically you're not supposed to pay tax on the same, twice on the, in the, same, uh, on the same source of income. So um, the second question you need to ask yourself, it's are you a resident or non-resident? Uh, as I said before, it's very important to differentiate uh, if you're a resident or non-resident. If you're a non-resident, you won't be only be liable on French earned income tax, only if you're resident, you will be liable on worldwide income. So it's, it's, it's a very big, big uh, difference, difference between these two uh, options that needs to be addressed. So according to the Code General des Impôts, uh, you are French resident if you respect three conditions, personal, professional, and economic. Um, yeah, uh, if you just, uh, move, uh, Adrian, you move, uh, if you want to go back on the, on the previous slide? Yeah, perfect. So, um, personal, it's if you have a main home in France, if you carry on a professional activities in France, or if you have economic interest in France, example, like investment business and stuff like that. In order to assist, to assist you with the determination of the residency, the general rule, but there is exception, especially with the COVID, where everyone is all stuck in France, all stuck in the US, you need to spend more than 100 on 83 days in France to be deemed to be a French tax resident. So, um, as I said before, there is a tax treaty between France and the US. It's a very complex treaty, but at the end of the day, the rule is pretty simple. What happens in France stays in France, and what happens in the U in States stays in the States. What does that mean? It means that if you have income in France, it will be taxed in France. If you have income in the US, it will be taxed in the US. But you need to declare all your income. If you're an American citizen, you need to report all your worldwide income every year, even if you're not an American resident. And if you're a French tax resident, you need to declare all your French income, uh, all your worldwide income on your French tax declaration. So if you declare your worldwide income, you need to apply some tax credits. And this is the job basically what I'm doing every day. It's to, to apply the tax credits to you to you to use different source of income. So for example, I'm going to speak with the rental income because this is the main, uh, the most important income that you might have between France and the US. Let's say you live in the US and you have an investment in, in, in France or you're just a French resident and you have some apartments that you want to rent. So basically this income is taxable in France because the property is located in France. If you have an apartment in the US, it will be located in the US, therefore tax in the US. So it falls under the category of revenu foncier and then there is a difference between if the rental is furnished or unfurnished. Uh, I'll get back uh, on that point in the next slide. US residents and citizens must also report the, the, world, the income in the US. They will be taxed in France, but they will be benefit of, they will, be dedu they will have a tax credit on that on the US side. So they will pay tax in France and get a credit on, on that in the US. Same, same principle with dividends, interest and pensions. If you come to France and you get pension from the US, there will be tax in, in the US and you will get a tax credit on that in France. So at the end of the day, all French revenue sources will be only taxable in France at the state level, most of the states. So you're not taxable, you will not be taxable at, at, the, at the, only, sorry, only taxable at the, at, the, at the federal level. So all US revenue sources are only taxable in the US, in the, in the US. Um, and you any, eh, perfect. So um, I was talking about the rental income. Uh, in France, it's kind of different from the US uh, because you, you need to apply a, a, specific, uh, a, specific, uh, 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 a specific idea on your, on your rental income. You need to first decide if you're renting a furnished property or if you're renting an unfurnished property. Then you need to choose the regime you want to be. So for example, the micro foncier, if you just rent like a small place and your turnover is below 1500 euros, uh, uh, you have a tax allowance of 30% of deduction. If you go to regime réel, it's going to be the turnover, it's limited, and you can deduct all eligible costs. So eligible costs are pretty much the same as in the US. It's all the, the expenses related to your apartments. There is few rules to respect, like in the US. It must be related to the building. It has been incurred uh, of, the, of the purpose of accuring the, the place. It has to be supported by the owners. And it has to be paid in the tax year. You can postpone uh, expenses from your two years. 
And lastly, and this is very important because I have a lot of clients who forget that once it must be justified. It's not like you just can take to your CPA or I want to deduct that type of expense. If you don't have the, the documentation to support your expenses, you won't be able to deduct it. Or you take the risk that in case of control, uh, you can be you can be uh, you can have uh, something to pay. Aluan, if you can, yeah, perfect. So still on, on the rental income for the non-residents, you're liable on the French income tax. So for the French for the French rental earnings, whether you are not or not resident in France, up to twenty five thousand euros, the rate is twenty percent, and beyond this level, is taxed at thirty percent. This this uh, this rate applies only on a red net rental income. Then there is a difference between if you're living in a, if you're living in the Europe as a non-resident or if you're living outside Europe, because there is a, a degravement, a, re, a reduction, an allowance, and you're going to pay going to pay only 7.5 percent. Benjamin, do you mind me asking um, how it compares to the U.S. side on the rentals? So on on the rental on the, on the, on the on, right. The, the tax the taxation on rental income compared to the US so it's pretty much the same thing the same rules apply there is no like the difference between uh, micro foncier and regime real and, and 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 stuff like that but what it's important in the US that you don't have in, in France is the depreciation expense in the US mm. you can deduct to depreciation expense in France you not this is the okay. main difference for the rest it's pretty much the same thing and something I've noticed with a lot of my clients is the justification of the of the expenses uh, I, I think in the US we are pretty much, uh, we, we can deduct stuff without proving that we, we have the expenses. And in France, we, we, we are very picky with the justification of the, of the, on the documentation of the expenses. And in case of control, we really need to be like to have all the information uh, ready and all the information can be justified. Okay, thank you. So an, an important topic also after the rental the rental income it's when you're buying a property and you're making a pre-value you're making a, a capital gain and uh, you need to pay tax on that. So the first rule for the primary residence it's exempt of capital gain tax. So if it's your primary residence it's it's uh, it's uh, you won't pay any capital gain tax. Only if your property is the second or holiday home you will be liable to uh, capital gain tax. So there is few rules to respect. The individual must have been considered as a French tax resident for the last two years uh, and at, at any time preceding the year of sale. And the exemption for the principal residence, for the primary residence, it's uh, only uh, it's only if you if you uh, uh, want to sell. Uh, yeah, it's only if you want to sell. You, you if you really planning to 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 sell your property. If you if you uh, if you're not planning to sell the property, the extension of two years won't be applicable to you. Uh, so for the rates, it's the rate of 36.2%, 36 and it's a, it's, a, it's a composition of addition of two tax, basically, the income capital gain, which is taxed at 19%, and the social charge at 17.2%. Benjamin, would you please explain what social charges are? Because it's, a, it's yeah. a term that we don't use in the States. Yeah. So in France, you need to know, it's, it's a good question, Iran. In, in France, you need to know that when you pay income tax, we think we pay income tax, but we actually pay two tax. We pay income tax on your revenue, and we contribute to the social charge. The French has a, a tremendous social security, uh, uh, it's a social security country. We can, we can get a lot of benefits from the social security. So on every, every type of income you have, there is always a, a, a rate specific to social charge. Like if you if you have a pay slip in France, you're gonna see you pay a lot of social charge on that. If you have a capital gain, you're gonna pay social charge on that. Also on the rental income, on pretty much every type of income, there is there is a social charge on that. So you would consider that equivalent to what we call FICA in the U.S. Yes, kind of. We can say that. It's not exactly, but yeah, so not exactly. Yeah, but right. the idea is the same. Yeah. Okay, and I know that on the social security tax on capital gains actually doesn't apply to certain people who are not resident in France, but yes. the government assesses it anyway, correct? Yes. And then you and then you can actually turn in a claim to get it refunded. Exactly. And you asked me last week if I uh, if I, I'm dealing with this type of case and I actually just deal with one case at the beginning of the week uh, for one of my clients. 
He was not supposed he was not supposed to pay tax in France. All his income was coming from the US. He has capital gains in the US, dividends in the US. And uh, so I did his declaration for him last year in France. And he was supposed to declare everything because he's a French tax resident. But he was supposed also to get a tax credit on every type of income he reported on his French tax declaration. Uh, so we was not supposed to pay any tax in the in the in, in France. And the, the bad surprise for him uh, when uh, when the French declaration asked him to pay forty thousand euros of of, uh, of income tax. Wow! And uh, I, we actually just win the case uh, yesterday. So okay. it's. Uh, so don't Thank be afraid you. when you when you do your tax return in France. Don't be afraid. Uh, sometimes there is mistake from the French administration uh, because they don't even know how to sometimes apply the tax treaty between France and the US. But you can claim that, and most of the case we we have uh, a gain on that. Well, they try to get as much money out of you as they can. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. that's, that's how it works. And then you I, have I to. I didn't. I didn't want to say that, but yeah, you're right. No, I I know for a fact. I've been audited, so I know that's what they do. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but okay, but on the capital gains tax, if you've owned the property, it's a secondary property, and you've owned it for thirty years, then basically there's no tax to pay after thirty yes. years of ownership, after, correct? Exactly. There is a reduction after a couple of years. I think it's on the next slide, or five. I'm not sure. Five. First, uh, the first five. Oh no. So yeah, it's yeah, whatever. I mean, it was on the slide from last from last week because we changed the, the slide. But you're right, Adrian. Um, uh, if you if you own a property for a long time, I think after for the income tax, it's after 22 years you get a reduction, right. and for the social security charge, 30. it's after 30 years. So the point is, you should own your property for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> um, Benjamin, we've got a question. When you refer to the state level in France, can you yes. explain that? So yeah, it's it's a it's a main difference between France and the U.S. I didn't uh, I was not clear on that. In in the, in, the, in the states, you always need to differentiate the federal and the state's tax uh, returns. In most of the states, you need to do two declarations. Uh, mm -hmm. If you uh, have a French uh, property or French uh, income in France, there is no difference between state and, and federal. There is only federal tax return in France. Even if you're living in the south, you're living in the, in the up north. I mean, it doesn't make any difference. There is one tax, one state, one federal tax, basically. But they call it the state in France. That's why it's confusing. Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so there are a few other taxes related to real estate in France. Uh, I, I know Adrian is going to come back on, on that some of the of the states of the this tax <laughs> after. Uh, so the first one is the tax foncière. Uh, so it's payable by the owner of a French home, um, and it's it's not something big. I mean, it's really like Adrian can confirm. Uh, I have a lot of clients who are very afraid to invest in France because of this tax foncière. Adrian, can you confirm? It's not something that we. Oh, it's uh, I call it nothing because it's it's literally about ten percent of what the average American homeowner pays annually. Um, and just to give you an example, my apartment in Paris, which is now valued uh, at about a million euros, my taxes this year were 627 euros. Yeah. If, this, if this apartment were owned in California, that would be $12,500 by comparison. So just to give you an idea. Yeah. Yeah, because French are always, I don't know why, I mean, I kind of know why, but French are always have this bad reputation of taxing a lot of things. At the end of the day, uh, if you compare the tax you pay in the US and the tax you pay in France, there is not that the difference. I mean, on some, not on the rental income, not on the, on the capital gains and not on the real estate area. No, that's true. I think we actually pay less tax here. Believe it or not, believe it or not. The, the, um, the difference the, the difference in France is we have a lot of few small taxes, like there is tax foncière, tax d'habitation, wealth tax. It's a lot of, of few words. Uh, when you don't know, like you, you're very really confused because you think you're going to be taxed from everywhere. At the end of the day, it's not that, that bad. I mean, there is tax foncière is one thing, tax d'habitation, it's, it's one other small thing. And, and the tax d'habitation is only if you if you live on the place, so if you rent the place, it's going to be paid by the, the rent, someone who's going to rent the place as January 1st. So if you move to France in an apartment uh, December 29, 
as January 1st, so the following year, you will, you will live in, on that apartment and you will be liable to the tax habitation. It's just one day where you don't need to be somewhere. But the tax habitation is going to be pretty much exempt by yes. 2023, I think, right? Exactly. For, exactly. for, for primary residences. Yes. Not there, there for secondary, but for primary. Exactly. There, there is a willingness from the government, from the French government, to lower this tax to, to almost nothing. So, again, this is not a tax you should worry about. Uh, and and uh, and uh, yeah, there is so this, this kind of two tax: tax foncière and tax d'habitation. And then uh, we have the French wealth tax. Um, so this one also you need to be very careful with that tax um, because if you're non-resident in France, uh, if you're non-resident, you're only going to be taxed on your French income. On, no, on your French income, on your French uh, real estate uh, valuation. So if you live in the States, you're coming in France just once a, once, a, once a year or a couple of weeks, so you're not French tax resident, but you own a property that worth more than 1.3 million, you will be liable to this tax. If you're a French tax resident, which means that you're living in France more than 193 days, you will be liable on this tax on all your real estate investments in real estate. So if you have real estate in the US, you will be taxed on that also. And the rate is progressive. So from zero to 800,000 euros, it's 0%. From 800,000 euros to 1.3 million, it's 0.5% and it's going up to 1.5%. And uh, I got a few questions on the chat. Uh, maybe we will get back to uh, on that question after. Pachi, maybe you, you want to ask the question? Okay. Should we do all the Q&As at the end, Benjamin? Sorry? Should we do all the Q&As at the end or? Yeah, yeah sure, yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Let's do all the Q&As at the end. I see some questions coming in um, that, you know, and it could apply to any one of us, actually. Exactly. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll give the hard ones to Benjamin and we'll take the fun ones, Adrian. Okay. I'm with you. <laughs> like always. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, well, um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, out of my field. I'm going to talk a little bit about real estate. Um, Adrian has so much fun with what she does there, but I'm going to talk about the numbers side of, of real estate. Because um, naturally, Adrian can give you hundreds of great reasons uh, of, of why you want to own real estate in, in Paris for the beauty, uh, Nice, all over France. Um, but I want to get into the nitty gritty details of what you should be thinking about before and after you, uh, you, um, you buy and sell, um, especially when it comes to being an American expat. Now, the nice thing is even when you're going abroad, you can take advantage of those mortgage credits um, and even the HELOC, the, the home equity line of credit. Uh, 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 benefits for one million on the home mortgage and a hundred thousand on the HELOC. Interest rates are so low that that's not going to be a huge benefit to most of us, but it's still a nice benefit. And the fact that we can still take advantage uh, for our primary residence of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per person, so five hundred thousand dollars worth of capital gains per couple um, on your primary residence sale is still a really nice advantage. Um, but we should be aware of a few things that we can't do uh, when we're owning abroad. Now, the first thing is that we can't use 1031 exchanges on international property. doesn't matter if we're selling a U.S. property to buy something in France or selling a French cop, uh, property to buy something else in France. We just can't do it. So uh, you, you, whenever you sell, uh, you're going to have to realize that capital gain if you have that capital gain. All right. We also, there's no way to buy inside of your IRA a property without essentially attracting the attention to, of the IRS. So we shy away from that. If you're buying a commercial property and it's only for commercial use, yes, maybe. But if you're using any portion of that home for your own personal use, essentially the IRS will not allow you to use your IRA um, to purchase it inside of it. So you have to take the distribution from your IRA pay the taxes, and then go ahead and buy the property from that. Now, you can't just think, oh, I'm not going to report the sale of my house to the United States because between FATCA and the CRS, yes, are they perfect? Are they talking to the, the opposite authorities perfectly at this point? No. Are they getting better by the year? Absolutely. So you don't want to risk that. And you've got to remember, if you fraudulently don't include something on your taxes, 
it doesn't expire. There's no, uh, oh, that happened more than three years ago. So therefore the IRS can't tap into that. Uh, we would typically say don't own real estate inside of a foreign company. Now that does not include uh, Société Civile Immobilier. Uh, SCIs uh, are a little different because they're a partnership, but we would not form a, a, uh, a foreign company to go ahead and buy that real estate beyond the SC, uh, SCI because you can make your U.S. taxes very cumbersome. Can you clarify that, Brian? I mean, the Société Civile Immobilière is a, company, a transparent company specifically designed to house property. So you're saying not to create a company, a different, a, another kind of a company. Exactly. Well, if, if, you, if you translate Société Civile, Société Civile right. directly in legal terms in, Amer in, in English, we right. the partnership. So if we set up a Société Civile, it leaks right down into our own, our own taxes, and it's just a partnership of what you own versus what I own. So that, that's why a Société Civile Immobilier is perfectly fine. But if we go into any bigger structures um, on, on foreign real estate, okay. all of a sudden doing your taxes on the U.S. side, you'll lose some of the benefits and you'll gain potentially uh, more liabilities from that front. So there's hardly ever a situation that we see that to be advantageous. Whereas a non-American, okay. it could be a very ad advantageous function. Now it gets to a little bit more of the complex issues. And so we'll go through an example on this. Um, and that is that, first of all, the house and the mortgage are considered separately from the IRS's vantage point. Secondly, um, as a US expat, you might have capital gains on a mortgage in a foreign currency, and that can come to creep up on us. Now, uh, Essentially, currencies haven't been something that we've had to think about so much in the past when it came to real estate, and that's why we're starting to talk about it now just for forward planning. The reason we didn't have to think about it so much was because the dollar essentially was going up. Therefore, even though Parisian real estate has been doing quite well in the last five, ten years, um, Adrian, we'll, we'll get- 20, uh, Since 1998, which was the low, it's been up, 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 and not stopping. <laughs> there, you, there you go. So despite real estate doing really well, because the dollar was going up, most people that were selling their properties in France didn't have a hit in the United States. But now since August, we've seen the dollar going down. Now- let me take a more expansive look at currencies. Currencies are cyclical, but we have to consider that when they're cyclical, they can last and go one direction for a long period of time. So let's back up a, a long period of time. Before the Euro, we naturally had the French franc, but we also had the ECU, which was the groundworks of how the Euro worked. And so if we go all the way back to the day that Nixon went off the gold standard and decided to let the dollar properly free float, we went from Nixon all the way to Obama where the dollar was devaluing compared to the euro, the ECU and then the euro. So we had a 40 year period where the dollar was going in one direction. We had a financial crisis and then now we had a pandemic, which both times that flocked money into the dollar. And so the dollar has been going up for 10, 12 years. Now it looks like we're going back into a time of dollar weakness. And that's to where we want to be prepared for these types of things. So we gave you an example. We gave it on a larger size property, um, just in case it is your primary, uh, primary residence. But it, this will impact you as well if it's a smaller property, if it is not your primary residence because you won't get that two hundred and fifty or five hundred thousand dollars worth of capital gains tax free allowance. So consider that in in the whole equation. Now, from the top left, we're just saying you buy a really nice villa in France for five million euros. Now, the IRS will take a snapshot of what the U.S. dollar versus the euro is. 
And so they're going to consider not that you bought it for 5 million euros, but that you bought it for 5,920,000. Now, essentially, we're going 10 years later that you sell the property, but you sell it for the same amount. Now, if you use Adrian services, I'm sure that's never going to happen, but we're doing this for just simple math. It could happen with a $5 million, 5 million euro chateau, for example, which is hard to resell. Okay. Could happen. Easy. The money. But pay. anyway. Wonderful. wonderful <laughs> um, but, but essentially, if, if 10 years later, we sell it for the same value, but the euro has increased to the dollar by 10% which is not far-fetched by most analysts' uh, predictions. Now, all of a sudden, when you sell that property, the IRS isn't saying you sold it for 5 million euros. They're selling, saying you sold it for 6.512 million euros. So they're going to basically say, well, you sold it for 6.5 million. You bought it for 5.9 million. You made $592,000 worth of taxable gains of which you're going to be kicking and screaming a little bit. But essentially, that means you're going to owe U.S. tax on a European asset that you broke even on. So you yeah. know the answer, don't you, Brian? I'm all ears. Move to France. <laughs> and then there's no capital gain, period. Uh, no, there's no capital gains on the French side. You're still having to report this in the U.S. and you still have to pay the capital gains tax in the U.S., Denou then you have to denounce your U.S. citizenship. <laughs> the, 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 key, the key factor is just being aware of, of these types of things. Um, because, like I said, if, if this is a vacation property, then it affects you at a much, much lower amount. Um, and, and it can impact you. But uh, essentially, one answer to that is to live in it for two years, and then it becomes your primary residence as long as you lived in it two out of five years. You can go ahead and use that two hundred and fifty or five hundred thousand dollar exclusion. Um, otherwise, you just have to plan for it financially, because if you're repatriating the money into the United States, essentially, um, that that was a proper gain in in U.S. dollars. Um, the other problem becomes that you can't just offset what you lost on the currency on the mortgage. So, when you think of things in French standards of you should pay off your mortgage, uh, you know, by the time you retire or anything else like that, then it becomes a moot issue. But okay, okay, but you're you're going to pay the capital gains tax on the French side, and then you're going to be able to uh, apply that against the U.S. taxation, right? If 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 it's a shorter period, yes. But if it's a longer period, then there won't be any French French tax to be paid. True. Right. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. Is it okay to ask questions along the way? I joined well, a little actually, I, I, we'd like to leave them to the end, but I'm being very, okay. I'm just being interruptive myself. <laughs> okay. Well, no, it's, it's, part, it's part of the panel. But we, we, we have only 20 minutes left, so we should move on and then get to the questions. Exactly. I'll, I'll cover one last thing on this, um, which is that the letter of the law states that if you have a gain on the mortgage, that is supposed to be a taxable event as well. Let's just say it was a break-even or a loss on, on, on the value of the house, but you had a gain on the mortgage. It's supposed to be reported. Now, most tax accountants, because there's not a good, easy, clear way to report that gain, they, they don't. But um, finding that tax accountant is probably something you want to think about before you sell the house so that you make sure that that's reported the way that you might want to. Again, these are just things to be aware of. They're not supposed to dissuade you in any way, shape, or form just with the, uh, the change in currency regimes. Um, with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Adrian to talk about some of the real estate taxes you should be thinking about on that side. Uh, Adrian, you're on mute. Yeah. Thank you. So I, um, just to repeat what I just said that you didn't hear, um, there are a few taxes that you will pay when you're purchasing property in France. So Brian, if you just go to the next slide. Okay, first of all, you've got notarial taxes and fees. 
Then you've got tax d'habitation and the audiovisual tax, which Benjamin's already covered, and the tax foncière, the capital gains tax, the rental income, and um, inheritance taxes. So let's go into a little bit more detail. Next slide. Uh, material taxes and fees are what you pay when you purchase the property. They equate to somewhere between seven and eight percent. It is a combination of taxes and fees that are paid to the notaire for the work that he does. And um, they break out in the way that little chart uh, on the right side shows you. But you can expect that if you're buying a property of a million euros, then you're going to have approximately 75,000 euros in fees, taxes and fees to pay. So just be prepared that you're going to have that extra amount. Now, at, but even though that's very expensive, the entry costs are high, the cost of ownership is low because the annual property taxes are so low. So in the end, it pretty much balances out. The thing is that you can't really flip a property successfully because you would want it to increase in value at least by that seven or eight percent or by 10 percent so that when you sell you at least recover the uh, the notarial taxes and fees that you've paid now um, interestingly um, this is affected by who pays the agency commission because the mandate between the seller and the agency, uh, the seller and the agency determines who pays the agency commission whether, commission, whether it's the buyer or the seller. If the buyer pays the commission, then the price of the property is reduced on the deed by that amount, which lowers the notarial taxes and fees. And if the seller pays the agency commissions, then the total price of the property is on the deed. And then you're paying the notarial taxes and fees based on the gross amount. So um, it can be an it's, it's, it's an interesting aspect of the purchase. It's something you should be aware of. It's something we always take a look at because if you're mortgaging uh, the price of the property, then the bank will only mortgage the amount that's on the deed. So if the deed is lower, you're gonna have a smaller mortgage and you won't be able to finance the notarial taxes and fees. I'm not gonna get into more detail on that, but it is something to consider. Okay, next slide. So the tax d'habitation uh, has already been addressed by Benjamin. It is paid by the person who inhabits the property on January 1. It does also include a, an audio visual contribution, which applied when the state, as in France, actually provided free television. Um, and so there was a reason to pay that tax. It really doesn't exist anymore, but they're still assessing it. So if you have a TV at home, you can expect to have a small additional tax. Uh, it, believe it or not, even though it applies to January 1, it's not actually assessed or paid until the fall, the following fall. I've never understood why that is, but that is the way it is. And uh, Emmanuel Macron, the current president, is in the process of abolishing this tax for uh, uh, residents, not for primary residences, so that by the year 2023, there will no, this tax will no longer exist for a primary residence. Secondary homes are still subject to the tax. Okay, next slide. Tax foncier, we have also talked about. This is your annual property tax. Um, uh, I don't think we need to go into too much detail on it. As I said, it's really about 0.001%. That's not how it's configured. It's not how it's assessed, but it does seem to end up approximately that amount. The two taxes seem to be about the same. Maybe Benjamin can weigh in on that. I find that they tend to be about the same amount. Is that true, Benjamin? Yes, definitely. But is there a reason for that or just happenstance? I don't think there is a specific reason for that. Just the way it is, I mean. Well, okay, it is certain that um, the taxes tend to be lower in, heavily, in densely populated areas. So in a city like Paris, for instance, the property taxes are actually quite a bit lower than they are in the countryside. Uh, for example, my property tax on my, uh, on my property in Nice is about double what it is in Paris, but the property is half the size of the property in Paris. 
So it makes it three to four times actually more expensive than Paris. And I think that has to do with the fact that it's just not as densely populated and therefore the tax basis is not as um, well contributed to by the residency or by the commercial. Is that true? Yes. It's one yes. part of it, correct? Yeah. Okay. Okay, next slide. So we've already talked about capital gains tax. We've already talked about rental income taxes. I want to remind everyone that um, these are taxes that are based on profits. So if you're being taxed here, it's because you made money. So it's not a tax that we should be that concerned with. Inheritance taxes are something to be concerned with. They are very hefty. Um, in France, there is what's called forced airship. For the French, they cannot disinherit their children. But um, as Americans, uh, we can choose the American regime, but not the American tax regime. So you can bequeath your property the way you'd like, but you're still going to be liable for French taxation. My um, advice would be to structure the purchase of your property from the beginning correctly to minimize the inheritance taxes for your heirs. And that is a complicated subject, but it's something that we work with everyone on just to ensure that there, there are ways to structure it. The SCI, the Société Civile Immobilière, is one way that the French have found to um, manage their inheritance situation because in, with an SCI, you actually own shares and the shares can then be bequeathed. So it gives you a little more flexibility and control as well. Okay, next. So, okay, on that note, that's, that's to completion. We've got, it looks like about 13 minutes for questions so we can open up the forum. And uh, here's how you contact all three of us. So make note of this. And since this is re being recorded, you actually don't have to take your notes now. You can just look back. And meanwhile, Patty, can you give us an idea of what some of the good questions are? Um, we have several questions. Um, IA, I don't know who that is, had a couple questions. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your questions? Not sure who that is. Okay, go to another one. Okay, we'll go to another question. Okay, this is from Sheila. Sheila, do you want to ask your question? You can unmute. We have lots of shy. There's she yep, coming I'm here. Great. I guess when we were looking for properties last year, the max we wanted to pay was like 780,000 uh, euro because after that you would have the tax. And I noticed on his spreadsheet he had 800,000. So is that the new limit? Um, so I guess the question for me about the wealth, the wealth tax. Uh, okay. Yeah, the, the limit was always the same before the, it's called, right now it's called IFI, Impost sur la Fortune Immobilière. Before it used to used to call uh, Impost sur la uh, ISF, uh, Impost sur la Fortune. Uh, but the, the 1.3 million was always the, the um, limit of 1.3 million was always the same. So if you planning to buy a property uh, to what you say, seven, 700,000 euros, you below the limits. And also when you talking about the French wealth tax, you need to take the net real estate uh, value. So if you're buying a property of 2 million euros, but you have 1 million of mortgage on that, you won't be liable to the French wealth tax. It's a net real estate value. That's a really good reason to take a mortgage. Mm -hmm. yes. because it reduces your wealth tax liability. Exactly. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. And we have another wealth tax question from Neil. Neil, do you want to ask your question? Sure. If, uh, uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, similar question. It's a little bit confusing when you read the the law, I, I'm not sure if the wealth tax starts at 800,000 or if it starts at 1.3 million. So it starts at 1.3 million, but from zero to 800,000 euros, you won't pay any tax on that, 0%. And from 800,000 euros to 1.3 million, it's 0.5%. But the limit, again, it's 1.3 million. 
I agree. So, it is confusing. <laughs> so, so you have to have 1.3 million before you're taxed. Right. Yes. Of That's what I needed to know. Value. Thank you very much. That's perfect. You're welcome. Very French way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's not fun if it's not complicated. Okay. Right. It ha there's no such thing as simplicity in France. Everyone needs to know that. <laughs> but okay. if you have any question, if you have any question on the French wealth tax, I really uh, recommend you to consult to, to have a consultation with the with the professional uh, about the French wealth tax because they're not uh, playing a game with the uh, with the French wealth tax. I had a client actually from a uh, last week a webinar uh, who was supposed to pay the French wealth tax from since five years, and uh, he had the mortgage, he had the natural estate value, and the value of the property were increasing and the mortgage was decreasing. So his net real estate value was decreasing every year. And we did a simulation together and he was liable to the French wealth tax since five, five years. Mm. So if you have any doubt on, on, on this type type of tax, don't hesitate to, uh, to, ask, uh, to ask us any question. Okay, and Johan has another question about the wealth tax. Do you wanna ask oh. your question, Johan? <laughs> Uh, yes. So let's say you have two million in four hundred one k or I IRAs or pension. Would you uh, pay wealth tax on that? No, it's only on oh. real estate. It's only on your French assets. And on real right. estate asset. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Okay. And Barb has a question. Barb, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Thanks, Patty. Uh, my question is. On the 1.3 million, Benjamin, who yes. did that's your global real estate asset. So who's going to determine the valuation of the American property? That's what Adrian is uh, working on. That <laughs> no, basically, uh, there there is few few ways to do it. Or you taking a, a real appraisal from a real estate agent, like Adrian can do can do it. I think you're doing that right. Um, yes. But yeah, like a website. They get dedicated to it. Yeah. Okay. You also so on, my Ameri on my American property, Adrian's going to make an official determination of the value? No, it's only on your French asset. Oh, okay, because I thought it was on your global re real but estate assets. Are you a French or U.S. resident? U.S. Okay, so it's only on the French, on your French real estate. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Um, Karen R., you have a question about residency and taxes? Yes, I do. Um, the question is, can you own French property? And can your French property be considered a primary residence, even if you are, let's say, a U.S. tax resident? Uh, in other words, you, let's say that you spend five months a year in your French property and the rest of the time you're traveling uh, or going to the States or going to another European country. No, definitely not. You need the first, the first uh, to get the exemption of not paying the capital gain. You need to be a French tax resident, and it's to be your main principal home, which means you're living there most time, most of the time of the year. Even if you spend more than 183 days, they can ask you. Uh, they can control that. Right. They are very, very picky on that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Richard Sherman. Do you want to ask your question? Sure. So if I were to buy property in France, I might want to stay more than three months, not necessarily to become a French uh, tax citizen, but um, just to be able to enjoy my property. Does owning property there impact beneficially my ability to get a long-term visa? So the I could stay more is no. The, it's very simple. Uh, owning property has absolutely nothing to do with immigration. They are completely separate ideas and uh, owning property does not necessarily benefit you one way or the other. The only thing that uh, France cares about is that if you come here that you can actually support yourself based on minimum wage, that you have health care coverage uh, for the first 90 days at least, and that you have a, a place to live, so which is something that we provide our clients with. We provide them with an uh, attestation cla uh, to um, uh, claim that they are do either do have a rental apartment with us or that we are seeking a permanent housing for them. 
and it's not difficult at all. But no, owning property won't help you there. Thank you, Adrian. I appreciate that. Um, Greg Wright. Greg has a question. Would you like to ask it, Greg? Thanks, Patty. Yeah, uh, Brian uh, was talking about, gave the example, I guess, of the $5 million villa around currency fluctuations in the coming years. Um, how does that affect an estate when, when that person passes away? Does the basis increase at the date of death or is it still when that per property was purchased? So under the current laws in the United States, it will it will increase to the date of death. Now, essentially, we have two proposals. One is a sunset clause in 2025, in which essentially the estate tax in the United States would automatically go down to five and a half million, and then it'd still have a step up in basis. But the Biden administration supposedly has a, uh, a proposal to bring it all the way down to three and a half million and no longer to step up basis. That hasn't been approved, it's just the rumor uh, the rumor mill of, of what might potentially happen with estate taxes in the United States. So currently, yes, you're fine, but it could be a change up in the next couple of years. Okay, but because it's a French property, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, how, it's only I mean, for your U.S. basis. So, so okay. essentially, the step up would be, uh, would be nice um, on the U.S. side, but it won't affect anything on the French side. Okay, thanks. Patty, we've got three minutes. Three minutes. I have to figure out where I want to go. Um, okay, Stephen Paulson, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, it, um, it's just kind of a general question. I mean, in the US, when you get to be 15, then 55, and then 70 and a half, um, things change financially in terms of government regulations. And I'm wondering if there's anything like that that we should be aware of um, when starting to think seriously about buying an apartment in France. So are there age constraints? Oh, uh, let me answer that one. Um, no, you can come as old as you want to come. You can be here. In fact, you. you will discover the best life you ever had for the least amount of money um, and with fabulous health care. Uh, you can't really get a mortgage. It would be very difficult to get a mortgage on the French side, but you might be able to use uh, your U.S. holdings to get a line of credit to make a purchase, which could be advantageous. Meanwhile, after you're here 90 days and you have your visa, you can apply for the French healthcare system. So uh, you can literally have 70% of your healthcare costs taken care of immediate, after being here 90 days, even though you didn't pay into the system. So you will find that living here is going to be a whole lot less expensive and a whole lot more fun. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you for that. Appreciate it. <laughs> We've got one minute, Patty. Okay, how about a question from Melanie about writing a will? Does Melanie, Melanie would you like? Ask? I can try, can you? You hear me? Yeah. Yep. Hello? Yeah, we hear you. Um, I'm wondering about when you want to write a will and you want to nominate U.S. law. In fact, in the U.S., you have to nominate state law. And how, how actually do you do that? And is it recognized in the U.S.? Um, yeah. You want to do it, Brian? No, you can no. do it. I'm happy to do it. So, so typically, you typically you you pick the last state that you resided in uh, for for that basis. You're using the Brussels Four Amendment to the Constitution over in Europe to make that election. So, if you have a French will, you're going to want to use the same aspect of that to take you into the United States. Now, as Adrian was saying earlier, you want to make sure even if you're electing different beneficiaries, that might increase your tax in France, i.e. If you elect to give it to a friend versus a relative, you're going to increase your estate tax significantly, even though you've shifted the, the uh, clearing of the estate over to the United States. 
That I understand. It's just more of an issue of the actual designation and then what happens with the, for example, the American TOD accounts. Do they pass to the second owner if you were to die or do they disperse as you've dictated in your will? I, I'm in a situation where I've been in France for 25 years, so I'm not really linked to any state in the U.S. Yep. So, so uh, the TOD accounts become a problem because that's not um, something that any brokerage firm in the U.S. will allow somebody with a foreign address to do because it's supposed to clear through the foreign jurisdiction first. So the safer way to go would be to construct a trust um, in the United States. Not in France. No, 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 no. You, you can. It's just the French will actually look right through it. So that the TOD is, uh, I'm assuming you're using an American uh, address on your right. account. And so right. when, when you're doing that, basically the brokerage firm is going to look at that in a weird way when you pass away uh, for that function. I would like to say that we are beyond our, our one hour now. Okay, we've gone into the hour. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And for all of your questions, we will uh, we, we will have a copy of all these questions. We can each address them and try to get back to you with some of these answers. So you might want to stay tuned for that. And um, just make note that our next quarterly forum is on April 28th. So between now and then, we wish you all a very happy, safe, COVID-free environment <laughs> and <laughs> hope that you can get to France very soon. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, team. Thanks so much, Adrian. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hey, Carrie, my necklace is on Facebook now. <laughs>